The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, a dragon, a seer, a bird on fire, and the absolute need for interstellar speed. Reconstituted ashes and an end to the dreaded apple pogrom. Okay. I've heard both. Heard of both. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. And I'm Publishing Intern Rachel Mintel. This time on the podcast, we have an interview with Reich E. Spohr. He's the author of a new entry in the Balanced Sword epic fantasy series, and the book is Phoenix Ascendant. The first two books in the series are Phoenix Rising and Phoenix in Shadow. Phoenix Ascendant is great action-oriented high fantasy, but it also has a lot more about the amazing and vast multiverse Reich has set the series in and the metaphysics of its gods and demons. So you just edited this, Rachel. What did you think of... uh, You haven't read the book, right? So what impression did it leave you of the book? Well, I thought it was really interesting how varied the world was. I did get to read the Training in Truth short story, so I had a little bit sense of his writing style, but I didn't realize how developed the world and the mythos behind everything was but it was fascinating to hear how long it's been in the works so training in truth is the short story that sort of teases phoenix ascendant although the care it's set in our world right yes different thing and this is said but the the character sort of crosses over the world yeah right at the end reich has created this vast mental map of this in this giant multiverse that he sort of writes within and from and draws his imagination from, and it's it's really cool to hear him uh, talk about it. It's somewhat daunting, because it's just gigantic, and he's been developing it for years. So we also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. But first, here's some news. The March new books are out, What a month this is going to be. We have four, count them, four original novels out this month. And all of them are really good and worthy of your time. So get them while they're hot. These include Entry 3 in the Multiverse series. This was the fantasy and science fiction cross-series that was begun by David Weber and Linda Evans. David has now picked up with Joelle Presby to produce Entry 3. That book is called The Road to Hell and it's out now. Also out is Phoenix Ascendant by Reich E. Spohr. This is the grand finale of the Balanced Sword epic fantasy series. Kyrie, Tobamar, and Poplock face the ultimate enemy in this one, and Kyrie finds out what it means to be the avatar of a god. Uh, we have a debut novel this month, and uh, that is The Seer by Sonia Oren Lyris, which is um, really great. It's a great book with a wonderful world building and a very sympathetic heroine. It's high fantasy. This one um, I sort of discovered, and I'm really happy to bring Sonia's work out. She's written a bunch of short stories that have been published over the years, but this is her really, this is her first big novel, and I think it's just wonderful. Finally, we have... What else, Rachel? Take us out. And finally, we have the latest entry in the Starfire series by Steve White and Charles E. Gannon. The war with the Arduins is over, but many of the warrior cast will not accept defeat. They won't? They will not. What have they done? They've gathered around a ruthless leader, and it's up to Admiral Trevain and young troubleshooter Ossian Weathermere to finally put a stop to their menace. The Road to Hell, Phoenix Ascendant, The Seer, and Imperative are now out at booksellers everywhere. Where? Booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Reich E. Spohr to the podcast. Hi, Reich. Hi, how you doing, Tony? Reich is the author of Bane books, uh, lots of Bane books, including Digital Night. It's a sort of transfiguration, Paradigms Lost. The Arenaverse novels Grand Central Arena and Spheres of Influence. 
with Eric Flint. He's the co-author of the Hard Science Fiction Boundary series, including Boundary, Threshold, Portal, and this new sort of segment in that, Castaway Planet, and later this year, Castaway Odyssey, which are really fun. He's also the author of novella Diamonds Are Forever with Eric Flint uh, in the Mountain Magic Anthology, and Reich is the creator of Epic Fantasy, the Balanced Sword series with... Um, uh, well, first, he's the uh, he's also the author of the Polychrome series, which is kind of an adult reworking of L. Frank Baum's Oz. And finally, Reich is the creator of Epic Fantasy Adventure, Phoenix Rising, Phoenix in Shadow, and now at Booksellers Everywhere, Phoenix Ascendant. Reich Phoenix Ascendant is the grand finale for Kyrie Vantage, a.k.a. the, AKA the Justiciar of Myrianar, the phoenix of, of the title of the books. And uh, in Phoenix, in Shadow, we, we conclude the book in Kaizen Tenze. Kaizen Tenze, yes. Which is a really cool land you create there that's, that's been lost for a long time. They've just faced a giant dragon in battle and saved the place from a horrible entrapment by forces of evil. Uh, I know it's a lot to ask, but can you sort of give us a quick precy of where we are at the beginning of Phoenix Ascendant? Well, at the at the end of, of Phoenix in Shadow, as you said, they've confronted Sonoma Viridian, the uh, Elder Worm Dragon, which was about like five miles across. Um, there was great lo there was a massive destruction uh, of the area, although they managed to preserve most of the city. And um, the main one of the main points was that in uh, Phoenix and Shadow was the discovery that the uh, bad guys had managed to make duplicates of uh, their many of their guardians. And the guardian duplicates were basically run off of their real bodies, their, their spirits. And so at the beginning of Phoenix Ascendant, they're trying to rescue the real bodies that are trapped underneath the wreckage of the uh, that was left after the battle. Yeah, that's a that's a really evocative scene with um with all those they're in like sort of tubes. Yeah, they were preserved there by well, effectively Master Wirren was a mad scientist. I mean, they called him an alchemist and so on. But his imagery is clearly mad scientist based. And he was using them as just a stepping stone and he needed their spirit energy for a particular plan of his. So they're all sealed up in these preservation tubes that allow them to be used for his ritual. And they can't get out and they are not actually conscious. Their, their mechanical bodies, so to speak, are still running. They're dependent on the real bodies and that whole area is about to collapse. So the opening scene is them trying to shore up the place and then get in there and remove the tubes fast enough before everything collapses on top of them. Then, But, but that's only the beginning because all they're trying to do is clean up and save as many people as possible before they, the three of them, Kyrie, Tobomar, and Poplock, set off back to their home, well, Kyrie's homeland of Evanwell, and try to confront the real big bad behind everything. Yeah. So before we go, uh, before we talk about the characters, um, what are we, what's the big overarching thing going on here? It's something called the Chaos War, right? These these occur every this place exists in a vast eons long scale that Zarathan does. What is the Chaos War? What is Zarathan? Zarathan is the world of magic. It is the source of magic or the keystone of it. Exactly how that works, nobody in in universe knows. I know, but it's not mentioned in the book. Um and it used to be a sister world. It is the sister world to Earth, and it used to be tied to Earth. But the uh, Kerlamion, the Lord of all Hells, the, the uh, baddest of the demon wards, decided he didn't like the way that civilization was advancing back in the ancient days of Atlantea and of the, uh, the civilization on Zarathan, which is the ancient Soren civilization. And so he figured out a way to seal off magic from Earth, which caused a cataclysmic rebound basically onto Zarathan. The theory is that the echoes of that are part of what causes the Chaos War, which 
is basically an uprise in war and unrest and magical chaos across the planet that ultimately leads to usually the fall of the civilizations, at least to some extent, and the loss of memory and of, and of even by the gods. So even the gods lose traces of what they are, so that even though technically the civilization of the, uh, the Sorens has been around for half a million years, they don't have half a million years of the, uh, the half a million years of advancement that you might expect. Every 12,000 years or so, one of these chaos wars comes along and everything's disrupted. And uh, they appear to be, if they're not directed by the demons, the demons take an awful lot of advantage of them, and so do other forces of evil. Um, unfortunately, since it is chaotic, it's much less favorable in general to what we would consider forces of light, goodness, and usually order. Although order can, of course, be used by evil as well. And there are signs that a chaos war is imminent, right? Yes, uh, that it is, in fact, underway. The biggest single signs being the fact that there have been multiple uh, assaults on essentially all of the significant countries across the face of Zarathan, not just the uh, um, State of the Dragon, but the uh, Empire of the Mountain, Evanwill is the only one, actually, we haven't seen a war in, but we know that evil forces have corrupted their guardians of Mirianar, the Justice Yars, have become corrupt, and Kairi is the only real one left. Um, Sky Sand, which is Tolomar's homeland, we later found out is besieged. Aegea is, Artania, the White Blade State, all of them have been, have suddenly been attacked. Um, the Sauron King, who has been ruling for thousands of years, was murdered in his throne room, and nobody could figure out how. Um, so, yes, the, everybody knows at this point that it looks like a chaos war is happening. And um, the main characters now have evidence that the person behind it, behind the chaos war, at least of the organized parts of it that are, that are disrupting all these countries, is the bad guy that Kyrie has been hunting all along. Well, let's talk about Kyrie. Your characters are so striking in the series. They're, some are literally symbols, as well as human beings. Kyrie is the last justiciar of Mirianar. Um, what does that mean? What kind of ability and powers does, does it give her? Well, justiciar is a god warrior, a, uh, a paladin, if you will. She is the living, heroic representative of a god, which means that um, she is given powers... And, and other similar beings are given powers that are appropriate for their god. In the case of Mirinar, who's the god of justice and vengeance, and who has a couple of other key portfolios in his, in his uh, godly package, um, he ha she gets the ability of truth-seeing, she gets greater strength and speed if she chooses to call in, and then she's acting um, for the god. And if she's just wandering around and decide to do something bad, she wouldn't be able to pull, uh, pull on the power of the god, but as long as she's acting in the god's service, she can draw on Mirinar's power to make her stronger, tougher, faster, to heal people, to protect her from various perils. Um, at one point in Phoenix and Shadow, she, with the help of other people, calls on Mirinar's power and is able to tear out immaterial, almost immaterial soul parasites and then repair the damage to the souls that these parasites have been causing, uh, something that nobody thought was possible. But if you've got a god backing you, even one that is, in the case of Mirinar, trembling on the edge of death, you still have a huge advantage over any ordinary mortal. Yeah, but the rules are generally that it has to, she has to be sort of serving the will of Mirinar for it to work. Correct. You, if you are the chosen emissary of a god, like Zarathan, you are expected to to be a paragon of whatever the god represents. I mean, if you're serving a god of evil, obviously, you, you've got to do bad things. If you're serving a god of parties and, and happiness, you're always supposed to be um, giving people entertainment and so on. You're like Dionysus or so on. Um, in the case of uh, Irie, you're a, a... You bring justice and if you must, vengeance. The, the tenants are um, mercy and wisdom before vengeance. 
So your your job is to judge people and judge situations and to do so wisely and with the idea that you should be ready to forgive people if there is worthiness in forgiveness. Um, it's a very difficult path to walk, and it seems, you know, it seems really easy at first. I'll, you know, destroy the evildoers and protect the good, but it usually isn't that simple, as Kyrie found out in her very first encounter in um, Phoenix Rising. Tell us a little bit about who Kyrie is, where she comes from as, as an individual, other than just being the Phoenix. She's got, she's, she wants to prevent, her brother has been killed, and that sort of sets her off, right? Yeah, she's one of three children of minor lords um, who are called the Eyes, because they watch the borders for the Watchland. Um, and and Evan well. her parents are murdered early in the first book. And they grow up with their um, their aunt, Victoria. Um, Rion, her brother, is always planning to try to join the Justice Yars. He succeeded, too. Kyrie always wanted to be an adventurer. She always wanted to go out and do good things. She considered joining the Justice Yars, but didn't really take it seriously because, well, that was what Rion, her brother, was going to do. And sure enough, Rion joins the Justice Yards, and everything looks good, and it looks like they might even solve the mystery of who killed their parents. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Rion gets murdered by something that she sees for a split second but can't make out except that what, what it is looks horrific. And then he, turn, he dies, and even the priest can't save him. His soul has been shredded. Then she makes the horrific discovery that it was the Justiciars that murdered him, and, uh, which should be impossible. This is one of the key points of the series, and the answer that you don't get to why it happened until the end of the new book, Phoenix Ascendant. Why? How is it possible for the servants of a god to go corrupt and the god not know it? Or, alternatively, the god know it, but be unable to say anything like, well, screw you, I'm not supporting you. Here, I'm going to choose these other people. You guys can all go. Mm -hmm. But Miriannar didn't. That by itself is one of the single biggest clues as to what might be going on in the series. But admittedly, the readers don't get enough information to figure out that clue um, until considerably later on. Yeah, and, and we do find out in Phoenix Ascendant <laughs> but we cannot talk about that now, of course. Well, I could, but that would be spoiling everything. That would be spoiling everything. So tell us about Tobimar um, and Poplock. Uh, to Tobimar Silverrun, who is he? Tobimar Silverrun, the seventh of seven, the seventh child of the ruler of the desert country of Sky Sand. Um he is of a family that uh, rules Sky Sand they have for time out of mind, um, and they are worshippers of the god Tarion, also called the light and the darkness, the nemesis of evil. Obviously good guys. Um, and then he is exiled from his homeland, not because he's done something wrong, but because he goes through a particular ritual all of his family go through, and the card of Tarion turns out. And for them, that means you must go and seek our ancient homeland, which we were driven from, and because of the chaos war effect, we don't know where it is anymore. And there's a curse on them that if the person doesn't go and seek the homeland, terrible things happen. Demons just start popping out of everywhere. Volcanoes erupt. Disaster falls. But they're, and they must go and search for the homeland. So far, nobody's ever found it, or if they have, they've never lived to come back home. So Tomar is out looking for his homeland, and he ended up getting connected to Kyrie in the first book and realizing that in one way or another his quest connected to hers. And in Phoenix in Shadow, we found out exactly how it connected and where his homeland really was. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh. Phoenix in Shadow is sort of the uh, is, is sort of Tobamar's book in a way. I mean, at least it, it it really develops his story a lot, right? Exactly, which is, in fact, one of the two reasons I titled it Phoenix in Shadow. The first is that they're going into a place that, at least from their point of view, as far as they knew, 
was a place filled with darkness. So they were going to travel into this place called Moonshade Hollow, which as far as they knew was filled with nothing but evil and darkness and, and monsters. But the other reason was that she was being, as a character, thrown somewhat into shadow because the real importance of the ultimate quest there wasn't hers. It was Tobomar realizing that this place, Kaiser Tenze, was in fact his homeland and that he had to discover what had happened here so that he could bring home the news to his uh, to his people and finally break the, the curse, fulfill the mission, and then maybe lead some of his people back to their original homeland. Yeah. And the, there's another, uh, there's a tr another character in the Triumvirate, and I, you know, this is the favorite character of a whole lot of readers of the series, and certainly my favorite character, Poplock uh, Duckweed. He's, Pop -lock, Pop -lock duckweed. he's a very adept magic user and brave fighter who happens to not be human. He is something else, right? He's a toad. Oh. A toad, so about the size of one's hand, at least when he, unless he stands up on his hind legs. He gets to about eight inches tall when he's standing on his hind legs. He usually rides on Tobomar's shoulder. Um, and he is originally more a sneaky type, a uh, access specialist, one might say. He's good at getting into places that he's not supposed to. Um, he started studying magic mostly because, well, a lot of the ways people in Zarathan try to keep you out of places is magic. But he became, by default, the one studying magic more than any of the others, because Tovamar is a sort of a, a warrior monk, uh, or at least in his discipline and skills, he's more like that. And uh, Kairi is, is a straight-up warrior with magical powers from her god. And Pomplock is by far the smallest and physically weakest of the group. So he has to make up for his physical incapacities. Um, by being smarter than everyone else. And he often proves this by outthinking people that otherwise would be able to destroy him in an instant. And he does that by a combination of long-term preparation, because he's also an alchemist and a uh, clockwork um, engineer, basically, and by having learned more magic and figured out how to make that integrate with the way in which he fights. And Tobomar happened to make a really, really dangerous team. He's uh, yeah. He rides on Tobomar's shoulder frequently. Yes, and and uh, shifts shoulders, and will sit on his head sometimes and talk down. He's very self-effacing. He's got a great sense of humor, and he sort of brings comic relief to the to the novel. What else should we know about him? He's he's his people have a kind of cool god. Smart. Yeah. Yes, he does. He he worships the the god of the toads, Blackwort the Great. Um, they, and even the Toad God is somewhat self-effacing. He doesn't have any super fancy titles, although his people are sometimes called the Golden Eyed, who is the Golden Eyed God. Um, but the important thing about Poplock really is he's got a very dry sense of humor that helps make him sound a little less serious than the others, but he is just as serious and, in fact, is the smartest and deadliest strategist in the group. Kyrie is probably the single heaviest hitter. Tohomar is the one with the most finesse in combat. But when it really comes down to it, it's usually Poplock that figures out what's going on before anyone else. And he has a great catchphrase. <laughs> Fear me! Yes. Yes. The, um... it, that, that was one of, my, one of uh, everyone's favorite phrases. Yeah. He has a little sword that he also uses. Of the sword? Yeah, it's enchanted, so it's pretty effective, right? Yeah, basically, uh, Constantine Koros, the magnificent bastard manipulati manipulator of the good guys, um, enchanted um, Steelthorn, which is what uh, Poplock named his little sword, uh, said sword being about actually the size of a letter opener. Um, he enchanted it so that it was not only magical, but it hits as though it were a broadsword being swung by a human being. So Poplock can swing this dinky little thing and it will chop off something's head. The book takes place, most of Phoenix Ascendant takes place in uh, Evanweil, Kyrie's home country. 
which is a kind of peculiar place. For It has been very much devoted to one God, for instance, which is very important for the story, right? What is Evan Wilde like? Evan Will is a, by the standards of the rest of Zarathan, Evan Will is a small backwater country that in this current day and age doesn't amount to much. A chaos war or so ago, it was supposedly very, it was a small but very important country because it um, guarded and was the uh, the gateway to the only pass through the Kalal mountain range, which is otherwise almost impenetrable. It's, it's a mountain range that's comparable or even slightly bigger than, in terms of height, the Himalayas. So having a navigable pass through is very important. Unfortunately, uh, one or two chaos wars ago, something terrible happened, and the nice... Uh, heroic people on the other side of that past suddenly disappeared and the past became filled with evil and nasty things. So the only useful sur- thing that Evanwell has now is that they keep some of that badness bottled up and don't let it out in the rest of the world. Other than that, though, it's considered a backwater. It's the home of the worship of Mirianar, but for some reason over the last few centuries, the worship of Mirianar has just sort of faded out of the world to the point that there's no other operating temples of Mirianar anywhere in the world except in Evanwell at the beginning of Phoenix Rising. We see uh, two other temples founded in Phoenix and Shadow, both of them founded, of course, based on the passage of Tobamar and Kyrie, especially, through the, uh, through the country. Um, other than that, it's a small country, probably, I'd have to look it up, but I think I have no more than like 20,000 people total in the entire country. Yeah. Um, the largest city is only a few thousand people. It's 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 a key, of course, because um, it, it's where our finale takes place, and it's where Kyrie's from. Uh, and all right, so a few other characters. Xavier um, comes back in this story. He's from Earth. Uh, we find out a lot more about him his origins in the story that's now up at the Bane.com website, which is called Training in Truth. Uh, what's his last name? How does he fit in with Kyrie and company also? Xavier Ross. Ross, yeah. Um, um, his full name is Xavier Uriel Ross. Um, he is a, a young man from Earth whose his original connection, of course, to the uh, group uh, comes when Tobomar and uh, Poplock are in the castle of the Sauron King, uh, helping with the investigation about the murder of the previous one, and discover that Xavier and his group weren't responsible, but somehow, since they had been suspected, they were locked up. And it turns out they escaped from a supposedly escape-proof prison. But Xavier stayed behind to watch what was going on and figure out if the people there were really the good guys or not. Um, Xavier then travels with Tobamar for quite a while, branched out on his own to go uh, uh, make some inquiries at a particular place for his own quest, because he and his four friends have a different quest that they have to complete on their own. It's important for everyone, but it's not shown in this. Maybe I'll get a chance at some point to tell their full story. Well, we do. We have met Xavier in another Reich's war book, which is uh, Paradigm's Lost, um, your contemporary fantasy. Yeah. And uh, that one, you get to see a little bit more about him, but you don't really get to see the story in the five, where they go and you know how they, how their adventure fits in with it. But anyway, Xavier is a specially trained young man. He learned a very peculiar martial art, which turns out to be similar to the one that Tobamar learned. And in fact, it's the same art. They just got taught differently by different instructors. The martial art of Tor. Tor is very important in the story because it is a martial art that was invented by the being that the demons fear more than anyone else, Torlin Valenhavi, the eternal king of Atlantea. It turns out that uh, Xavier and Kyrie also share something, a great deal of appearance. Specifically, they have the same hair, or at least they did before Kyrie got her hair transformed by Mirianar, uh, to Mirianar's colors. And most importantly, they have the same weird gray eyes. Gray eyes of a color of a 
particular shade of gray that's extremely rare and signifies someone who does at some point in their relatively recent ancestry um, have the eternal king somewhere there. Xavier's middle name, Uriel, is also similar to Kyrie's youngest sister's first name, Urel. There are parallels, and it is suspected that some of this must have to do with Chorus's manipulations of events trying to accomplish whatever it is he's trying to accomplish. He's a being on the side of good, but what exactly he's trying to do, very few people know. He's, he's, Koros is kind of a super cool character as well. Um, t tell us a little bit of what, about him. He's shown up several times in the, uh, in the narrative. Constantine Koros. Very, within the, the books, you don't learn exactly what he is. I can tell you that he's one of the very, very few actual survivors of Atlantea, the fall of which was organized by the demon ruler, Perlamion. Yeah. We find out something about that in Paradigm's Lost, right? Yes, we do here. We get some more detail on that. Basically, Perlamion, basically, uh, Koros is carefully building his revenge. You've heard revenge is dish best served cold. His is going to be served half a million years cold. <laughs> the five, which is, including Xavier, are just part of his revenge, as is, to be honest, Tobamar and Kyrie and even Poplock. Everything, you know, the line of the, the emperor is very apropos. All that has transpired here has done so according to my design. He's playing chess against beings that are millions of years old and he's keeping up with them. What that means is that he'll do an awful lot of things that only a total bastard would do because he's doing it for an ultimate goal that's very good. That's why very few people trust him, but very few people can dare ignore him either. Yeah, he's playing the really long game. Yes. And he, he is, he's one of the, he's able to sort of play on the, the field of the gods as well, maybe above the gods. He plays up on that level. He is a spirit mage, which are the most powerful magicians. And is and he must be able to play up on that level because he intends to ultimately confront the beings behind the Chaos Wars and the destruction of Atlantea. He has to he wants to he has arranged the breaking of the seal and then he wishes to actually destroy the ones really responsible because they destroyed his entire civilization, including his children. It's an interesting bit of trivia that he had, in fact, five children, three boys and two girls. And the five that we see later happen to be three boys and two girls. This is not coincidence. Uh -huh. He is a man of symbolism and of humor and of very careful irony. Yeah, and he there are certain things he knows but can't say, and so he's always holding back things he, he kind of wants to tell them. He and the Wanderer both know an awful lot of things that are going on and cannot tell them. They dare not. Because as the Wanderer explains, and I believe in Phoenix and Shadow, there are events that if you tell someone they're going to, that if you tell someone something, you affect it, what their choices are. And if you know that that will cause them to go in a direction that ultimately will lead to more destruction, you can't tell them, even though it would also save them pain now. Um, and the Wanderer uses the example of, well, what if the Wanderer had come in and stopped the... Uh, come in and, and help Poplock get rid of the initial problem that got him adventuring in the first place. Well, Poplock wouldn't have left right away. So that means he wouldn't have met Tovamar. Tovamar probably would have gotten killed. If Tovamar didn't get killed, he still wouldn't have had Poplock along with him. They might not have met Xavier, and they certainly wouldn't have met up with Kyrie in time. And if they didn't meet up with Kyrie at the right time, then she wouldn't have trusted them, blah, blah, blah. So the whole thing falls apart simply because he did something good. So even doing something good can be bad if you know that it's going to lead to a disaster later on. Yeah. And it sucks being omniscient. They have something like a prophecy. Yeah. So to, the bad guys, um, we meet the king of all hells, uh, Kerlock, 
Herlamian. And he, he's got a son via Dravarian. What are they trying to achieve? One is, I mean, obviously great evil and suffering. Yeah, that's the, the characteristic of evil demons. Note that demons can choose good or evil. That's one of the characteristics of being an intelligent being. You can make the choice, and that's one of the points that, of what happened in Phoenix and Shadow, of course. Yeah. The, uh, but we have Miri and her, her, her friend Calche, who eventually, at the very end of the book, realized they, never wa they didn't want to stay bad guys. But those that are actually following the, the, what we would consider the normal demon path are indeed interested in suffering and destruction. They're oppressors. They gain strength off of pain and, and uh, torment of other beings, of gaining power, of upsetting other works, or of setting up their own in the particular way they want to. Some of them can be less interested in torture and just more in doing things their way. But they still don't care what you think about that, and so it ends up being uh, bad for you anyway. Kalimyan is fairly straightforward. He is a living black hole, in essence. He's, he's a mystical black hole um, in humanoid form, although he can take other forms if he wants to. What that means is he is essentially the most powerful physical force that you can imagine. He has little, while he's capable of subtlety in a general sense, it's not his forte and it's not his interest. He has been balked many, many times over getting what he thinks is his rightful dominion over Zarathan, the world of magic. Um, he's come up with the help of his son, Via Dravarian, and that will hopefully get him the dominion he's been looking for all along. Um, Carlemion is almost a classic despot. He is not stupid, and he is quite capable of tolerating occasional failure, but he is much more sharp-tempered than um, is probably wise. But when you are as powerful as he is, he can get away with being arbitrary and even cruel, even to his subordinates, because, well, there are very few beings in the universe that can stand up to him for any length of time let alone for any serious combat. Via Dravaria, at least from what we've seen of him, and we see a fair amount of, of the being called Via Dravarian in um, Phoenix and Shadow and then later on in Phoenix Ascendant, obviously has some other agenda. He is the puppet master on the side of darkness. He knows about Koros, and he considers Koros his equal, his... his um, his opposite number and honored enemy, it would appear, at least based on the way in which he reacts. Um, he likes surprises. Not that he likes losing, but he seems to like surprises. He's a very strange villain. He's clearly evil. He likes hurting being, other beings. He likes shocking them and destroying whatever it is that they value. We do have a hint at the end of Phoenix in Shadow. Without a hint, we have an actual statement from Neri, the former demon turned something else, when she has an experience that we get to see, but she unfortunately does not remember because it gets wiped from her mind, uh, when she is confronted by him and discovers that he is not, in fact, Via Dravarian at all. And she calls him by another name. The name is Light Slayer. We don't know much about that, but we do know that obviously she finds it terrifying because as soon as she sees it, she is horrified. Whatever this being is, it is something sufficient to terrify even one of the more powerful demons we've come across. So while the name Fiedra Varian is used, we know that that's not actually who it is. Unfortunately, our characters don't have access to that information, so as far as they know, they're going up against Fiedra Varian firstborn of Kalamia, which is bad enough as it is. He's mm -hmm. obviously powerful, very intelligent, and ancient. Yeah. Well, the the whole world, uh, Zarathan has a it has a touch of other evils and magic that it makes it a bit different than, you know, your standard epic fantasy. Uh, vampires exist, and uh, werewolves, 
Can you say a little bit about the monsters that exist in Zarathan? <laughs> Without saying too much. <laughs> there are almost uncountable numbers of, of monsters. Um, uh, just the world, just the vampires alone, there's five different, six different varieties, multiple different types with different characteristics. And in fact, this becomes somewhat important uh, during Phoenix Ascendant. Um, the werewolves range from the type uh, that we know of from many movies, you know, a man contaminated by some sort of a magical disease that allows him to turn into a wolf, uh, to the ones that we've seen in, that we see in, uh, in Paradigms Lost, uh, the, the, the great wolves, which are not really wolves at all, and they're basically soul-eating monsters. Um, across Zarathan, you'll run into all sorts of other creatures. You'll run into intelligent plants and giant um, hives of fire ants that literally breathe fire. Um, you'll have shapeless blobs that are intelligent or things that you might, that we might call elves. They call themselves the Artan, you know, civilizations thereof. Um, things that we might call trolls and ogres, um, creatures that might be more at home in H.P. Lovecraft's world. Um, there is almost no monster or creature that you can imagine that doesn't exist somewhere on Zarathan, partly because, as Koro says during one of his lectures to Kyrie in the first book, um, Z Zarathan isn't a world. It's more like an infinite number of worlds layered upon each other. There's a Zarathan that we see most of the time, but there are other Zarathans, and it is possible for one to slip from one Zarathan to another. Each world has other monsters, and they can all interchange sometimes. So really, there's almost nothing you can't find on Zarathan. You could find a crash-landed alien in power armor, or you could find a ancient god sealed away in a tomb, just like something that Conan might run into, and so on and so forth. Yeah. What There's there's the feel of epic fantasy, of course, but this. what do you think your, your influence, I feel maybe a manga influence, uh, superheroes, I mean, everything, like you say. What do you think your influences in creating this, this world are? Well, I've been building Zarathan for almost 40 years now. I first started, the first story that I wrote that took place in Zarathan was, start, I started writing it in 77. So I've been constructing it for 39 years. My initial influences, of course, included um, The Lord of the Rings, Stephen Donaldson's Land, the uh, Conan series, and since I was a gamer and going on, I'd say one of the single biggest influences on the gaming side was actually supplements written by a man named Dave Hargrave called the Arduin Grimoires. The feel of that world influenced my initial development of Sarathan a lot, where he had basically a kitchen sink universe. Like uh, one of his one of his descriptions was, "Where is the alien with a blaster going to look stranger walking down the street? Your hometown." For a world where there's already a dragon, um, two ogres, and an elven wizard. Guess what? Mm -hmm. It doesn't stand out nearly so much in the second case. Mm -hmm. So after that, then you should get a lot of uh, anime and so on influence. The, the most significant one there would probably be an anime called Saint Seiya, in that the original name of the Justiciars wasn't Justiciars, it was called Saints. That got changed later. And that was a deliberate nod to Saint Seiya, which had these god uh, god warriors which represented the constellations who were called saints. So you had Pegasus Saint and Cygnus Saint and Scorpio and so on. Um, the Justice Yars, of course, have a theme of birds, and Kyrie has decided to take the theme of mystical or magical flying beings. So she's got Phoenix, and she plans, if she founds a new group, to have things like dragon and griffin and so on. Hers. There's a actual phoenix like sort of uh, fate that she I mean she becomes the symbol that she's in, she's adopted in a way. Yeah, that's sort of spoiled on the cover, so I guess you can't really make much of a secret of that. Yeah, <laughs> not terribly surprising. You've got a 
you've got somebody whose name is Phoenix. She says she herself is the rebirth of things. So one, it isn't going to be too much of a leap to assume that she gets put into a position where death is imminent, that she might not do something like that. This is a super cool cover. Is this, this is Todd Lockwood, right? Yes. Lockwood did all three of the covers. He did a beautiful job on all three of them. And I noticed another thematic thing about each, about the three covers when I put them together that was kind of interesting, that the colors get steady, steadily lighter. Mm -hmm. the, the cover of Phoenix Rising is very dark. Yeah. The Phoenix in Shadow is lighter, and the one uh, Phoenix Ascendant is brilliant, brilliantly gold. So it's really a good progression of, you know, you start out with the world in darkness, and then you head toward the light. Yeah. But they're, they are, as a group, they're by far my favorite covers. Yeah, this I mean, it's really... I, would, I, I like this one best of all of them, and they are all really just great. I think if I was going to choose one of the three, I think I'd still take the first one simply because it's the one that shows all three of the main characters, including our favorite, Poplock. Yeah. Well, yeah. Todd really wanted to get Poplock in both of the other covers, and we just couldn't figure out, given that he wanted to give do particular scenes, we couldn't figure out how to put them in there. Yeah, well, we don't want to set Pop Lock on fire. <laughs> no, don't set me on fire. <laughs> you do a good Pop Lock. So what are you working on now, Brack? Well, I'm just about finished with Challenges of the Deeps, which is the third Arenaverse novel. I've got like two chapters to go on that, I think. Sequel to Spheres of Influence? Uh, Spheres of Influence was the second, and so this is Challenges of the Deeps. Follows like shortly after Spheres ends, and so I'm going to try to wrap up at least some of the most important, immediate problems. I mean, the the setup of the universe and the, arena, uh, and the arena universe is so huge that there's no way to tie up all the loose ends in one or even two books. But I'm going to I'm doing my best. Yeah, this is sort of a science fiction. Uh incarnation of these va of, of your vast world uh but the the arena verse is oh. like leibnizian nodes of i don't know it's hard to explain it's a well the arena verse is basically my modern day tribute to doc smith mm -hmm. who was the founder of space opera as we know it and wrote gargantuan star spanning epics that didn't just travel from star to star, they traveled from galaxy to galaxy. And uh, his, his uh, Skylark series ends with the literal destruction of, with the, um, with the heroes, destroying two galaxies by merging them star by star while carefully saving all the good guys' planets in both galaxies and moving them to a third. Um... There, there, there's almost nothing in science fiction that reaches that level of, of, of scale. Mm -hmm. So what I tried to write was something that would at least uh, make him nod and say, oh, that's a good try. And, uh, you know, it's a salute in general to all the Golden Age science fiction, trying to give it a modern, um, modern feel so that modern readers can access it, since a lot of the older stuff isn't so accessible to modern readers for things ranging from... Uh, language and conventions of, of writing have changed to, you know, casual sexism or other things that might give people a knee-jerk, oh, I can't read this reaction. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, the, I am about 40,000 words into uh, into um, Princess Holy Aura. Yay. My magic <laughs> girl <laughs> novel. Um that one's probably going to be one of the hardest ones for me to write because there are so many ways it can go wrong, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I've got to really dive into it once I get challenges sent off. After that, I've got another sequel to the Castaway series, which tentatively you're calling Castaway Peril. Um, I don't know if that's what's going to stick. And another collaboration with uh, Eric, which is going to be in a new universe. That one's tentatively titled Fenrir. Um, and it's going to sort of be our, uh, actually, I don't want to spoil it because I don't know how much uh, we want to talk about it until I've solidified some of the facts on it. There's other things I have in mind. You know, I've sent in a couple of other proposals to you guys, but we haven't committed yeah. on any of those yet. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, Princess Holy Aura. <laughs> Is that what? Princess Holy Aura, that's the one that I am certainly looking forward to, do, to, uh, to finishing that one. 
And you did get a little taste of something else that I've done work on with the Xavier story, since it's actually part of the first book in the Spirit Warrior series, which would tell the story of the five. Yeah, that is, it's a good meaty novella, too, so you can get a lot of, uh, you get a real good good story out of it. Yeah, I, I, it really worked well. I wasn't sure at first, but when I took it out, I said, you know, actually, this did make a nice, solid story by itself. Yeah. And that's on the Bane.com website right now, and it will later be in the uh, free short stories ebook, free short stories 2016 ebook collection to read there. Yeah, remember, remember the first hit's free. That's right. <laughs> so, the book that is out now is Phoenix Ascendant by Reich E. Spore, book three in the Balance Sword trilogy. It is now out at booksellers everywhere. Reich, thank you very much for being with us. Oh, thank you, as always, Tony. It's a pleasure. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free, or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 27 Hydrocarbon, sure enough, Gardner said. Her voice was barely audible between the silver suits they were wearing and the air pack. She knew this, so she tapped Fontana on the shoulder and made sure he saw the blinking indicator. Take off your mask in here and you're going to hit the deck fast. No worries, Steve shouted. The same could be said for the zombies. There is some good news. And one spark and we're going to go sky high. Fontana noted. He used his hand to bang on the next hatch. Anybody home? There was an answering banging, regular, not frenzied like zombies. I knew we forgot something, Steve said. Spare air. How many? Fontana shouted. He put his ear to the hatch to hear the reply. I think they're saying four. Stand by here, Steve said. I'll take Gardner back to the ship, but I'm not sure how to... We'd have to fit them. They must have a clear or reasonably clear air supply in there, Gardner said. And if they're females, they're probably pregnant. Not good to have them exposed. I suggest we run blowers down here and clear out this passage, then extract them. And we get blowers where? Fontana asked. There are some on the cutter, Gardner said which we already had to do a six-hour run up to and a seven-hour run back, Steve said. He was either going to have to figure out how to tow the damn thing or strip it soon. That was one of his nagging issues. It's a supply ship, Fontana said. Would they have some? We can try to ask, Steve said. Do you have blowers, Fontana said. Blowers. Where are the blowers? If they're answering, I can't hear. They're saying something. We passed an aid station, Gardner said, pointing back the way they came. Which would have blowers, Steve said. No, Gardner said, but it might have a stethoscope. Fontana ripped off his mask and leaned into the hatch. Where do you have air blowers? This air you can't breathe it. Where are the air blowers? Ow! Gardner snapped, holding her ears that the stethoscope was inserted into. That hurt. Fontana quickly redonned his mask and took a deep breath. Wow, that really is foul. Gardner waved a hand for silence as she listened. Ask them if they said locker by engineering. She pulled the stethoscope away from the hatch and covered it with her hand. Locker by engineering? Fontana shouted through his mask. Yeah, that's it, Gardner said, 
nodding and taking off the stethoscope. Okay, you can bellow as loud as you want now. You got a clue how to use these? Steve asked, looking at the fans and big coiled duct stuff. Mechanical wasn't his gift any more than singing was. As a matter of fact, I do, Gardner said, but I'll need some help moving them. Oh, oh, my poor pregnant back. There's a reason Sadie is back on the large, Fontana said. In the end, Gardner did pretty much all the work but the toting. And in 30 minutes, they had the blowers evacuating and replacing the air in the corridors to the survivor compartment. How long? Steve asked, looking at the descending sun. It wasn't red, which wasn't necessarily a bad sign. A bad sign was if the dawn was red. When this says it's okay, Gardner said, holding up the hydrocarbon meter. Picky, picky, Fontana said. Women. You know, Fontana, on a boat like this, I know ways to just catch you on fire. Ah, God, not now. What? I gotta puke again, she said, hurrying to the rail. Be right back. You gonna be okay? Faith said, as Hooch puked all over the rail. Jesus, he said, shaking his head. Sorry, that's not what... I mean... I'd say I puked the first time, but I didn't, Faith said, then shrugged. I mean, I have puked, trust me, but I've seen worse than this. You should have seen some of the stuff on the Alpha. How many of these have you done? Hooch asked. The scene in the lower deck was fucking awful. The male of the group, presumably the dad, had survived. By feeding on his family in what had been the master's cabin. From the looks of it, They'd all zombied and had been fed on one by one. As he'd killed them, he'd brought them down into the cabin as a nest and slept with the dead and decomposing corpses. Hooch had managed to hold it in until he noticed one really totally what-the-fuck detail. At the head of the bed, not covered in filth, almost like a little shrine, was a teddy bear. Like somewhere in the thing, on the boat's brain, It almost remembered that it had somebody it cared about. It just couldn't recognize that it was the tiny little corpse it was feeding on. People keep asking me that, Faith said. I need to get a count. Five, Steve said, nodding. That's not bad for a boat this size. Come on, we'll get you over to the rescue boat. Wait, one of the men said, holding up his hand. I'll stay on board. Why? Fontana said. If we leave the boat, it's salvage, a woman said. (laughs) Heh, Steve said, grinning. It's salvage already. You're not going to get screwed, but you kind of want to sit down and have a chat about the new reality. You do. You really do, Gardner said. And I'm saying that sort of officially as a member of the Coast Guard. In fact, as far as we can tell, I'm the number four senior United States Coast Guard officer. Because there's only six of us left. What? The man said, his face going ashen. Just come over to the boat and get some fresh air, Steve said. We're not going to pirate your boat. Not exactly pirate, Fontana said. Hey, I wonder if I'm like senior NCO of the army. In that case, I think Hooch is the commandant. How much fuel in the tanks, Hooch? Faith asked, looking at the form. She was letting him do it for the experience. Besides, the post-clearance tasks were getting old. Like half a tank, Hoot said. But dead batteries, Faith said. Okay. Hey, Paula, toss me the slave. Slave cable, Hooch asked. Got it in one, Faith said, as Paula hefted the cable up from the other boat's engine room. Vicky makes it up from cables and stuff they find. They do a little salvage in the harbor when the zombies aren't real active, or the off-boats they can get to that don't have any. But it's stuff like this. I mean, I've had a couple other people say they'll try out clearance, and they see one boat like this and give it up. It's not just the zombies. Who clears them out? Hooch asked. Oh, the crews do, Faith said. If you want a new boat, that's the catch, unless it's a hand-me-down like the Endeavor. Okay, engineering deck hatch is over here.
That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Christopher Rocchio, Rachel Mintel, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a switch that will make all the short eyes in the world take on the long vowel pronunciations and a lifetime membership in the Talking Toad Pan Multiverse Society, including full voting rights and a two-year supply of mayflies and mosquito larvae, to Reich E. Spohr, author of Phoenix Ascendant. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. The Bane Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bane Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. Thank you.